Good morning, everyone. My name is Leslie Ann Camacho Mujica. I'm a procurement official at the Procurement Division for the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program. In this meeting, we are going to discuss the request for proposal to procure implementation management services for the economic recovery programs. I would like to introduce the PRDOH personnel. Along with me is Jeanette Buchamp, Technical Specialist at the Procurement Division, Jose Luis Rivera, Deputy Director of the Economic Development Program, and Carolina Fernandez, Legal Advisor at the Federal Compliance Division. Any questions submitted in this meeting will be answered in writing and published in an addendum. Any information provided in this meeting does not change the terms and conditions established in the RFP instructions. The meeting will be recorded and available in our CDBG YouTube channel. All procurement processes shall be conducted in accordance with the terms and conditions established in the procurement manual for the CDBGDR program to ensure full and open competition and fair treatment to all persons and entity involved in the procurement processes. The procurement manual is available at the CDBG website, incorporated by reference and made an integral part of this RFP. Now I will let you with Deputy Director Jose Luis Rivera of the Economic Development Programs for an explanation of the scope of services for this RFP. Good morning, buenos dias. Uh, thank you, uh, Leslie and the rest of the team for the opportunity. I uh, will be presenting uh, shortly. Okay, wonderful. So once again, uh, my name is Jose Rivera. I am Deputy Director for the Economic Recovery Grant Management at the Puerto Rico Department of Housing for the CBDGDR, CBDG MIT economic development programs. Today we will be presenting on the request for proposals CBDGDR-DRMIT-RFP-2022-14 for the implementation management services for economic river, uh, recovery programs related to CBDGDR and CBDG-MIT. Just as a disclosure, uh, for this, is, this presentation is only for information purposes only, this presentation does not modify any of the terms, conditions, and requirements set forth in the RFP. The agenda uh, contains an overview, a program description, programs workflow, program roles, implementation services tasks, and timeframes. Time First, as an overview, PRDH is using the request for proposal RFP to procure implementation management services for firm or firms that will assist the PRDOH in the implementation of economic recovery programs. This presentation will concentrate on implementation processes and needs for the following programs, community development block grant, disaster recovery, CBGDR, specifically the program's Small Business Financing Program, SBF, and Regrow Urban Rural Agricultural Program, Regrow. Programs descriptions. For the CBDGDR Small Business Financing Program, provides funding to support small businesses and microenterprise recovery through a recovery grant of up to a maximum of $150,000 to cover working capital and or equipment. For the CBDGDR Regrow PR Urban Rural Agricultural Program provides funding <clears throat> up to a maximum of $150,000 to businesses to engage in agricultural activities to promote and increase food security, enhancing and expanding agricultural production, related economic re revitalization and sustainable development activities. Program workflow, intake, educate interested businesses and request, a, and request correct documents. 
gather documentation, prepare and submit application. Eligibility review, review documentation, analyze the eligibility. Pre uh, prepare case for underwriting and notify eligibility. Underwriting review, perform underwriting on med need cost reasonableness and DOB analysis. Prepare cases for environmental review and award processes. Award process, sign grant agreement, educate beneficiary on grant, grant compliance and close out and dis, uh, disperse cases. Expenditure review and close out, review submitted receipts and national objective documentation. Finally, project close out. Program roles, key staff, program manager, will be the main point of contact between the PRDOH and this and this contract and is accountable for the productivity of their team. Must have a bachelor's degree from an accredited institution, must have at least 10 years of experience, must have five years of experience in project management, project or program management, banking, accounting, supervision, and production management. A project management professional certification is preferred. Customer service coordination, coordinator, will oversee all interactions with applications for the programs, including interactions between staff and applicants. <clears throat> will manage and ensure that staff complies with policies and procedures of the program when interacting with applicants. Must have a bachelor's degree from an accredited institution and at least five years of experience working with customer service related positions. Program management, banking, accounting, lending practices for business administration. Agronomist will validate as per the requirements of the program, the applicant's business model, the reasonable, reasonableness of their request for funding, their financial viability of the business and or their proposed business plan in the final report. Must have a bachelor's degree in agronomy, agricultural economics with three years or more of experience in agronomy as well as agriculture, field development or research and development will also require prior experience conducting agronomist evaluations and deep knowledge of agricultural processes. Program management role, key staff, underwriter, will evaluate applicants for financial viability based on the requirements of, of each program and identify award not notifications to qualified applicants. And after receiving approval, send out award not notifications must have a bachelor's degree in business administration from an accredited college or university with a major in finance, accounting, banking, or real estate. Must have a minimum of three years of experience. Excuse me, Mr. Rivera. Right now it's frozen the it's frozen. presentation. <clears throat> Is it working now? Ahora se ve. Yeah, if we can go to the display settings and go to duplicate. Okay. Perfect. Is it looking good now? Yeah, right now we Thank you. So to the next role, tax leads responsible for organizing and training and being on hand to provide technical support and expertise to staff to complete the task. Must be able to provide summary reports, compile information and recommend plans for corrections, as well as manage their staff day-to-day -day operations. Must have a bachelor's degree 
from an accredited institution and at least five years of experience in their area of expertise. Task uh, specialist, responsible for completing the day-to-day -day work identified within the program SOP, standard operating procedure. Must be, uh, must be able to learn and absorb policies and procedures, learn systems quickly, and be able to operate in an environment with multiple priorities must have at least a bachelor's or associate degree from an accredited institution so, or have at least three years of experience in their area of expertise. Implementation services tasks. Task one, intake support. Contact potential applicants to support conducting pre-application and initial application orientation and document, documenting the eligibility criteria and requirements as established in the guidelines of each program. Task two, eligibility review and support. Educate the prospective applicant program processes. For example, DOB concept, inquiring about other benefits, Davis Bacon, among others. Conduct eligibility analysis based on program guidelines. Notify eligibility determination to applicants. Task, task three, underwriting review and support. Ensure that all supporting documentation necessary for underwriting analysis is included in the file. Conduct underwriting analysis based on program guidelines. Notify underwriting determinations to applicants. Task four, environmental review. Complete housing and urban development HUD and National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. Required environmental reviews for projects associated with economic recovery programs. Program-based reconsideration requests. Conduct applicant issue resolution by responding to applicant formal complaints and, uh, and program based reconsideration requests, including complying with any applicant resolution procedure established by PRDOH. Task six grant, uh, grant agreement signing and submission for disbursement. Explain to applicant the award process for the program, including agreement documents, conflict of interest forms disbursement instructions and receipt submission instructions. Task seven, grant agreement life cycle and support ensure closeout documentation meets all requirements per program guidelines and process SOPs before issuing final compliance uh, determination. Task eight, closeout program and support. Perform verif verification of supporting documents on file for applicant final a file. Determine beneficiary compliance with grant agreements, recapture funds, and close files. Finally, timeframes. Intake support, approximately approximate time to sign grant agreement submission, 110 days. Eligibility review and support, approximate time to sign grant agreement submission, 40 to 70 days. Underwriting review and support, approximate time to grant agreement signing, 30 to 40 days. Environmental review and support, approximate time frame to sign grant agreement submission, CST, 75 days. EA, environmental assessment, 90 days. Program-based reconsiderations, approximate time to sign grant agreement submission, 20 days. Grant agreement signing and submission for disbursement, approximately approximate time to sign grant agreement submission, five days. Grant agreement life cycle and support, scheduling routine follow-ups at, at a minimum of 30 days to check applicant progress and secure accurate information on business use outcomes in line with program national objectives. This task shall not exceed five business days. Closeout process. Task shall not exceed, exceed 15 days from the date the case is ready for closeout. If there's any questions, please follow the instructions uh, per the procurement division. Uh, please submit in writing uh, per RFP instructions. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you to the Deputy Director, Jose Luis. Now I will be discussing about the submission requirements for this request for proposal. 
The RFP documents are available for download at the CDBGDR website as presented on screen. And the important dates for these RFP are as follows. The submissions of questions and requests for clarification are due on or before December 15, 2022 at 4 p.m. AST. The responses to those questions and requests for clarifications will be on December 21, 2022. The proposal's due date are from January 17, 2023 at 9 a.m. AST on or before January 19, 2023 at 4.30 p.m. AST. The proposers, um, the responses, I'm sorry, to all the proposers' questions will be answered by an addendum and will be published on the CDBGDR website. All the documents regarding these RFP, including any agenda issued by the PRDOH, are and will be available for download at the website. All proposers are responsible to monitor the CDBGDR website for any agenda that may be issued by the PRDOH. The proposals will only be accepted by electronic means. The PRDOH will neither require nor accept any physical proposal submission. If a proposal is submitted both in paper and electronically, only the electronic submission will be considered for the evaluation process. The proposals submitted after the prescribed deadline will not be allowed. Proposers will receive access to submit the proposals after completing the registration process through the CDBGDR website. Once the scheduled submission period begins, a link will enable access to the registration form. Please complete all the required fields on the form. The proposal must be submitted within the closing date and time schedule. Access to upload the proposals will begin three business days before the closing schedule date and time. Now I will let you with my coworker Jeanette Bisham, who will be explaining further about the evaluation criteria and other requirements. Good morning, everyone. Evaluation criteria. The evaluation committee will evaluate responsive proposal according to the following criteria listed in order of importance. Professional qualification and experience of the proposer to successfully perform the service required in this RFP as evidenced by the successful implementation of similar programs in large complex public organizations, preferably in state government and municipalities. Professional qualification specialized experience of the proposed key personnel as evidenced by relevant experience to the role proposed. Quality of the proposed approach and its relevance to the services described in this RFP including implementation scale and understanding of the Department of Housing goals. Capacity of the key personnel and the ability to commit adequate time to effectively perform the services in the role assigned within the required time frame. Financial stability of the proposer and its capacity to effectively perform the services. Resultness of overall price allocation of effort and overall value effort. Now, some registration. Proposer at and first tier subcontractor must be re registered in the system for award management, better known as SAM, at the time of the proposal submission or initiate the registration process right after the proposal submission. For more information, please visit the SAM website. There is no fee to create, renew, or update your registration. Awards will only be issued entities that are cleared and not ineligible of award of a contract due to the suspension of the department or hot imposed limit denial participation. Now, to explain about fair compliance requirements, we leave you with Carolina Fernandez of the Fair Compli Compliance Division.
Hello, everyone. Thank you for the space to present compliance and labor standards requirements. This presentation is prepared in English. However, should anyone need this presentation in Spanish, you can request using the protocols for this RFP. I am representing the Department of Housing Federal Compliance Team, led by Maria del Carmen Figueroa. Today we will discuss, as part of our agenda, an overview of compliance roles and responsibilities. We will also cover some tools that are available online. We will also talk about documenting efforts, taking advantage of training that's made available, and reporting requirements as well as frequently asked questions. In this presentation, we will be discussing Section 3 training, hiring, and contracting opportunities, minority and women-owned business participation, and fair housing and equal opportunity. Contractors or subrecipients using CDBGDR or CDBG MEC funding have certain roles and responsibilities. These include assigning staff who will attend the day-to-day -day implementation of federal compliance requirements, attending trainings and workshops, using tools and templates, executing the activities and completing documentation that's required. You can also participate in Department of Housing sponsored technical assistance sessions. You must complete quarterly reporting and comply with the reporting requirements. The procurement package contains sections that speak to the applicability and the requirements for MWBE. Within those sections, you will find helpful links to online resources that are made available, such as the policy guide. Procurement packages also contain language for Section 3 under 24 CFR 75. Although for this particular procurement, the contractor awarded will not need to comply with Section 3. However, you may find the information useful if you are seeking to prove Section 3 status to earn potential bonus points. Let's talk about Section 3. Section 3 is a federal requirement from the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968. This requirement states that we should provide to the greatest extent feasible job training, employment, contracting, and other economic opportunities generated by this HUD financial assistance to be directed to low and very low income persons and businesses. The Department of Housing makes available a Section 3 policy guide on their website, both in English and in Spanish. Contractors must read and implement activities as applicable and necessary. They also are responsible for their subcontractors assuring that benchmarks are met. For Section 3 projects, 24 CFR 75 has established the following benchmarks. 25% of the total labor hours for a project should be work hours of Section 3 workers. And from that 25%, 5% of the total labor hours should be work hours of targeted Section 3 workers. Let's talk about the definition of a Section 3 business. A Section 3 business refers to a business concern, meaning at least one of the following criteria, which is documented within the last six months. The business is at least 51% owned and controlled by low or very low income persons. It could also be a business that has at least 51% ownership and controlled by a public housing resident or residents who currently live in Section 8 assisted housing. It could also be a business that has over 75% of the labor hours performed for that business over the prior three month period by Section 3 workers. In this slide, we're going to look at the definition of a Section 3 worker. A Section 3 worker can be any worker who fits or when hired within the last five years fit at least one of the following categories the worker's income for the previous or annualized calendar year is below the income limit established by HUD. It could also be a worker who is employed by a Section 3 business concern, or the worker is a youth build participant. Now let's talk about what a targeted Section 3 worker is. 
a Section 3 targeted worker for community development financial assistance projects is a person who is employed by a Section 3 business. It could also be a person who currently fits or when hired fit at least one of the following categories as documented within the past five years. Someone living within the service area or the neighborhood of the project as defined in 24 CFR 75.5 or a youth build participant. The neighborhood or service area for a targeted Section 3 worker is that in which you can find at least 5,000 persons within a one mile radius of the project. If there are less than 5,000 persons within that one mile radius, you can expand that radius until you have 5,000 persons around the Section 3 covered project site. Each year, HUD releases new income limits. These income limits typically come out around April. The latest income limits for 2022 are made available on the slide. The Department of Housing has created various forms for helping maintain compliance. There is a Section 3 plan that can be used by contractors or subrecipients. There are also Section 3 self-certification forms. And finally, there is a form to help you document your efforts. Let's take a closer look at your Section 3 plan. This document helps you identify new hiring needs, subcontracting needs. It helps you plan your outreach efforts and assists your coordinators in identifying the day-to-day -day activities. It helps you define compliant procedures and it helps you understand your reporting requirements. You can use the link on the slide to visit the website and download a Section 3 plan template. In this slide, we want to focus on the Section 3 self-certification forms. These useful tools help you uncover if workers or subcontracting businesses meet the income thresholds required. HUD offers also a business registry. This registry allows you to register yourself as a Section 3 business. The registry also has a tool that helps serve folks looking for Section 3 business databases. We will now turn our attention to minority and women-owned business compliance. There are various regulations that call for the inclusion of minorities and women business enterprises. 2 CFR 200.321, as well as Executive Orders 11625, 12138, and 12432, establish the participation of MWBE firms, which seek to ensure that when possible, contracts and other economic opportunities funded in whole or in part with federal housing and community development assistance are directed to minority business enterprises and women business enterprises. The Department of Housing has established an MWBE policy guide. This is available on the website in both English and Spanish. You can access those documents using the link on the slide. Let's look at what a minority business enterprise is. An MBE is defined as a business which is at least 51% owned, operated, and controlled on a daily basis by one or more American citizens of the following ethnic minority and or gender and or military veteran classifications. African American, Asian American, Hispanic American, Native American, Hasidic Jew, persons with disabilities, and other individuals who can prove social and economic disadvantage. Women Business Enterprises, or WBEs, are businesses that are at least 51% owned and controlled by one or more women. The owners must be U.S. citizens or legal resident aliens whose business formation and principal place of business are here in the U.S. or its territories and whose management and daily operation is controlled by women. 
The MWBE Policy Guide will identify that there are goals which apply to professional services, purchasing supplies, and construction contracting. There is a total of 20% minimum participation goal. This 20% is comprised of 10% for women-owned businesses and 10% for minority-owned businesses. Contractors are expected to perform good faith efforts for contracting, subcontracting, and purchasing opportunities of $10,000 or more during the life of the contract. The Department of Housing has also created various forms for helping maintain compliance with MWBE. One of those is the MWBE Utilization Plan. This document template allows contractors or subrecipients to identify how they plan on being in compliance with these contracting goals. There is also a waiver form. This document allows contractors or subrecipients to identify if they meet the requirements to waive their goals for MWBE. Let's look at the MWBE Utilization Plan. This tool helps you compile data for your subcontracting. It helps you identify what needs you may have. It helps hold discussions on creating supplier and contractor listings, and it provides awareness of meeting the goal for the contract and tracking. You can use the link on the slide to go to the website and download the plan template. Let's review how you should complete your MWBE Utilization Plan. The Department of Housing Utilization Plan template can be used throughout the life cycle of your contract. Completing the plan is pretty easy. You should read the general instructions in Row 3 and complete Sections A, B, and F from the document. Complete the information requested in the yellow cells. When we talk about certified minority or women-owned businesses, we are referring to those who have filed applications with federal entities such as SBA and others that you see here on the slide. Businesses who are certified can provide proof of completing an application process to be officially recognized as a certified minority or women-owned business. If you are registered as an MWBE, you should provide your valid certificate or other evidence in response to this RFP. In this section, we will be discussing how to complete your efforts and quarterly reporting. In order for you to report your efforts, the Department of Housing provides a tool. This tool helps you document and identify how often you are seeking interactions with Section 3 businesses and MWBE businesses. The quarterly reporting form allows for you to share and report your data with the Department of Housing. This allows the agency to fulfill oversight responsibilities and monitor the progress throughout the year. The Department of Housing's quarterly reporting form allows for the user to capture multiple compliance areas all in one Excel form. Section 3 data is collected. MWBE data is collected as well. FHEO, information is also documented within the report. And finally, for those who have construction projects, there is a report for Davis-Bacon Unfound Workers Efforts Reporting. Awarded contractors will be responsible for reporting four times a year, on April 5th, July 5th, October 5th, and January 5th. This ensures that you are meeting benchmarks and documenting your efforts. The quarterly reporting template is also available on the Department of Housing website. Let's briefly discuss FHEO. Your RFP package will also contain a model contract which outlines fair housing and equal opportunity areas of compliance. Contractors are responsible for ensuring compliance with federal civil rights and fair housing through their contractors, subcontractors, and so forth ensuring that all necessary efforts are being made. The Fair Housing Act and Sections 109 and 504 prohibit discrimination against the following protected classes of people, race, color, national origin, religion, sex, age, familial status, disability, gender identity, and sexual orientation. 
The Fair Housing Act is part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There are many executive orders, laws, and statutes that govern the non-discrimination of protected classes to ensure equal opportunity for individuals in accessing federally funded programs. Equal opportunity is afforded to protected classes through a number of these federal laws and executive orders. The Department of Housing has published policy documents attending FHEO as well as language access plan. These policies must be implemented by contractors and subrecipients. They are publicly available online in both English and Spanish. You are encouraged to click on the links and access the resources available. As a recipient of HUD financial assistance, the Department of Housing must ensure that all programs affirmatively further access to fair housing and that the programs provide equal opportunity for participation and employment. Reasonable accommodations are changes made to policies, practices, services, and structures or modifications to afford equal opportunity to individuals with disabilities. The costs associated with providing reasonable accommodations and modifications are to be incurred by programs receiving federal funding. HUD contemplates these additional costs as necessary to ensure that the programs and activities it funds do not discriminate against people with disabilities. The slide contains a link for you to access the reasonable accommodation page on the Department of Housing website. Limited English proficiency refers to a person's limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English. Due to Puerto Rico's high Spanish-speaking population, all entities and contractors using the CBGDR funding must seek to ensure that both a person's limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English or Spanish will not place them at a disadvantage in the participation of programs. Let's briefly discuss some common, frequently asked questions. Can a business be both Section 3 and MWBE? The answer is yes. A business or a contractor can be both because these compliance areas are actually separate. Section 3 identifies the level of incomes to determine the status. MWBE uses race and gender information to qualify a business. If I am not planning on subcontracting, do I still need to complete documents? The answer is yes. You should still submit your MWBE utilization plan, the documentation of efforts template, and your quarterly reports. If Section 3 doesn't apply to my contract, do I still have to complete the quarterly report? The answer is yes. You will have to complete the MWBE portion of the report and the portion of the report that attends to FHEO. If I'm either an MBE or WBE, do I fulfill the total goals? You may have safe harbor for one of the goals for MWBE participation of 10%, but you will still have an additional 10% goal to show good faith efforts for any subcontracting or purchasing you perform with the CDBGDR and CDBG MIT funding. What happens if I don't fulfill the goals before the end of my contract? All awarded contractors should perform and document their efforts. The Department of Housing has developed templates discussed in this presentation that help you complete the exercise. You can submit a waiver before the end of your contract for approval. This waiver request should be submitted with the efforts and justification as appropriate. Thank you for attending today's training. We hope you found the material helpful. Please remember to direct all your questions through the established protocols for this procurement. Thank you to the procurement team for allowing us to present this material. I will stop sharing the presentation so you can continue with the session. Thanks everyone for participating in this meeting. Please remember the important days of this RSP. This presentation will be available on the YouTube channel. Also, we apologize for the technical difficulties of the presentation. The presentation will be published through an addendum. Thanks everyone, have a good day.